if one looks at transport in the present and last century, it's obvious that the steam engine is more than just a symbol of man's achievement. It has had a strong romantic appeal, and the dedication of countless thousands of train lovers probably surpasses that of even car or aeroplane enthusiasts. Which is why the end of the line, in the real and most poignant sense, is such a nostalgic sight. Here at Stratford Works in East London, old locomotives are being cut up for scrap metal at the rate of two or three every week. Ironically enough, this train graveyard is the place where some of them were actually built between 1921 and 28. Now, having been replaced in northeast London by an electric service, over 50 tank engines, as they're called, have been withdrawn from service and are being converted into scrap. Within a few days, these powerful old locomotives, once identifiable as the N7 class, will be reduced to just 60 tons of characterless steel and cast iron, copper and other non-ferrous metals. Needless to say, there is a never-ending demand from enthusiasts for souvenirs of these old-timers, whistles, name and number plates, and there have been requests for the cast-iron chimneys weighing three and a half hundredweight. Here, for example, is a number plate which will be saved for collectors. Unlike their flesh and blood counterparts, these old iron horses, as they were affectionately known, can't be put out to pasture at the end of their life service. They're not efficient enough for work anymore, yet too valuable to stand idle. Each one, in fact, is worth, in scrap, nearly 1,500 pounds. Hence, we get sad, although admittedly spectacular, sights like this. Pictures like these provide a sorry but inevitable reflection of the times in which sentiment is not allowed to stand in the way of progress. The age of steam is practically dead. Well underway, railway modernization means the end of the faithful steam engine. How refreshing it is, however, to recapture those days when a train journey was almost an adventure. Return to the time when fond Victorian parents endowed their daughters with the names of flowers. Here, perhaps, are the Misses Primrose, Violet, Lily and Iris in modest but becoming dresses. Apt, then, that they should be riding on this train, for this is the famous Bluebell Railway. Today, the Blue Bell Line is run entirely by amateurs who give up their weekends to pursue this so English hobby. Where else in the world would anyone spend every day off working? But then it said men never grow up, and we suppose this is merely an extension of every boy's love of trains. You can exchange your British Railways tickets here for a trip through lovely Sussex countryside. There are three stations along the line, Sheffield Park, where we are now, Freshfield and Horsted Keynes. Don't get the impression there's a reason for this journey, however, except to enjoy the ride. People tired of catching the 8.30 every morning like sitting in a train that goes for no particular reason. Nothing here really differs from the National Railway, except that you have the pleasure of being pulled along by a romantic old engine with a stovepipe for a funnel, and the fact that there's only a single track. Collisions are avoided by right-of-way rule, which means that, as you saw, the engine driver is given a key to the points. Now this is really nice. 
At one point, you know, the authorities actually wanted to close the line. Said something about it being uneconomic. Well, of course, you just can't close things in England. Preservation societies outnumber building societies. We've said that all the workers on the Bluebell line are amateurs. This is not strictly true. One of the engine drivers, in fact, is a professional in the sense that he works for British Railways during the week. Life for him is just one long return journey. The driver, you see, has given that right-of-way key back to the signal man. Now another trainload of pleasure seekers can begin their trip. Yet, on Monday morning, over a hurried breakfast, they'll silently curse the need to catch a train at all. You might think there's nothing unusual in seeing a Land Rover on the road, but take a closer look at this one. Notice the extra set of wheels. They're the basis of the second new idea, the road railer. Impenetrable country inspired this further addition to the vehicle's collection of spare parts. Where roads are non-existent and the railway is the only means of communication, you might think a car is useless. But you'd be reckoning without the bright chap who took stock of the situation and made it rolling stock. By sticking some bogey wheels on, hydraulically operated so they can be raised or lowered for convenience, he made a diesel engine capable of pulling up to 50 tons. Foreign as well as British railway executives are interested in the road railer, and versions of it could revolutionize transport. Don't, however, forestall that revolution by removing your car's tires for a spin up the local track to work. If we all did it, we'd have yet another traffic problem. We might even see stations cluttered up with parking meters. from Dunton Green to Stebbing Green in Essex, where the architecture can only be called contemporary insofar as nobody ever gets tired of it. A thatched roof, perhaps more than anything else, seems to typify the beauty of English country life, life that ambles virtually unchanged from one century to the next. If you admire the Thatcher's skill, a skill that has its roots implanted in the earliest records of English history, then you'll admire the ingenuity of Mrs. Emily Kane. And if Mrs. Kane's ingenuity isn't at first apparent, we'll explain that her thatched cottage once belonged to the London North Eastern Railway. It was, in fact, a second-class railway carriage. But you'll agree it makes a first-class home. Mrs. Kane has lived here for the past 13 of her 71 years. The carriage was brought to Stebbing by its previous owner, who got it for 25 pounds from the railway yards at Stratford. It's impossible to guess its present value, but it cost Mrs. Kane 550 pounds. But in these days of inflated house prices, that's not an unreasonable sum for a home with a bedroom, kitchen, lounge and bathroom, plus running water and electricity. Mrs. Kane has called her off-the-beaten-track retreat Hillview, but her point of view is equally admirable. She thinks she couldn't be better off as an old-age pensioner because her house is comparatively cheap to run. In every sense, a home on the right lines. He might be wearing a burla one day, for he has great prospects. He's a clever student from Leeds University, who, with his pals, is just working on the railway for fun. It's not only students who spend their time here, but it's the university's railway society that first got permission from British Railways. In fact, this is the world's first railway. The Middleton Railway dates back to 1758, before the Stockton to Darlington was thought of. They're now moving rolling stock full of goods for final dispatch by British Railways. Playful work or workful play. You can bet their kids won't get a look in when it comes to a train set for Christmas. Uh, 
over the level crossing, over the road they go. In a city where parking space is precious, they've garaged free of charge a whole history of transport. This sign of time past is a memory of journeys made before a ride through London was a gear-grating shuffle. A memory of stylish horse buses that went at a gallop. They went even faster when Stevenson's rocket appeared on the transport scene, but that piston-packing infernal machine terrified everyone. No, they didn't chain the wheels, it's the belt drive of this old puffing billy. This new London Museum of Public Transport is the joy of anyone tired of packed roads and the pride of the men who keep those engines spotless. But whirling Christmas trees clean today's trains. Well, that's what those rags on a roundabout look like when they're raring to scrub the grime off the 810 to town. Not only clean, but bright. That's the sort of washing action anyone would dig. And digging into the future is this trackside trencher that will help speed trains through the worst winter weather. For in place of the shale and dirt which the machine's sharp fingers are scooping out, they'll lay drainage pipes to ensure that excess water doesn't sink the commuter's chances of getting to work on time. The trencher can dig to a depth of six feet below rail level at a maximum speed of 150 yards an hour. But this modern equipment being brought into extensive use by British Railways is even more clever. For it leaves that trench as clean as a guard's whistle by taking away the rubble and loading it into trucks. Just watch. Here's a driver with a really different approach. innovations are as eye-catching as this, but your journey is faster and cheaper as a result of the little trackside monuments you pass without a second glance. Observe now the automatic greaser, a device which saves thousands of pounds every year by doubling the life of a rail. It's placed at the side of the rail head of curves where friction does most damage. Then you wait for a train to finish the job. You see, as each train passes this point, it pumps its own ration of grease and applies it to the rail. But however well greased, let's get away from the beaten track. And this old weighing machine is one of the reminders that British Railways once issued tickets, not teas, in this converted station at Nunnington, Yorkshire. There's no station master now to blow his whistle. The kitchen kettle does that. The old Northeastern station was closed in 1953. The actual line itself, from Gilling to Pickering, closed completely in August 1964, just one year after filming. Modernization has made many small stations obsolete. There's always something new on the horizon, like this rail quad cycle, designed by Birmingham manufacturer Dick Pashley. This is certainly one way of beating the closures, though at seven miles an hour, it may not be every businessman's cup of tea. It's a freak glimpse into what the future could be when more non-paying railway lines have given way to road traffic. He may not have to pass a railway driver's test for this machine. Surely these policemen aren't out of their depth, but what goes on? It's a fish out of water again, and it's a big fish, a famous locomotive carted on a trailer through the streets. that Pickford's the haulers aren't a private company but part of British Rail Services reduces the ignominy not a whit. The Royal Scot, that proud king of the steam engine age, is on its way to a rusty resting place in a Skegness holiday camp.
105 tons of famous yesterday is on its way with the skirl of the Royal Scots Pipe Band to its memorial site, carted on rubber tyres along a motor road, but saved from the breaker's yard. Early morning at Newmarket and the clatter of hooves on cobblestone stable yards. This is the place to see real good horse flesh. Though you mightn't expect to meet up with a horse of the calibre of Charlie, a 17-year-old gelding whose very existence tells you what horsepower really means. Charlie is no racing phenomenon, but he's well-groomed for the specialised task of shunting railway wagons. In fact, Charlie and his stablemate Butch work a seven-day week doing a job which no engine can do half as quickly. It would be at Newmarket, of all places, that the railways keep two old faithfuls in full harness. And it's not part of Dr. Beeching's economy, though their fuel is just 30 bobs worth of hay a day. Progress trundles by without nostalgia or character. Perhaps it's good to realise that in all this rush of modernisation, Butch and his handler, Mr. Lawrence Kelly, are hitched to a tradition which railway officials admit is still best for the job. Old Charlie couples strength and determination, yet it's his nimble footwork which really keeps him on the right track. He can ignore points and manoeuvre trucks into position in a way which no diesel shunter could ever hope to better. There's peaceful retirement waiting for Charlie and Butch when their wagon train days are over, but that end of the trail seems a long way off. The old warriors still have enough steam to keep them rolling. It's not always easy to shunt aside new ideas. And that's why the famous old Festiniog Portmatic Narrow Gauge Railway is still this sort of link with the past reality today. There was a railway here when steam engines were unknown, with train loads of slate from the mountains going down to the coast by gravity and horses to haul the empty trucks back. Now, tourists keep this narrow gauge line alive. Before World War II, this private railway ran at a loss, almost crippling the enthusiasts who ran it. Since then, in the effort the world has made to rediscover its roots, the Festiniog Railway has made a comeback as a curiosity and a bit of old world peace. Tickets, please. But in fact, he sells the tickets as a conductor does on a bus. This is all sorts of yesterdays. Here's a museum on wheels with more of its old disused track being cleared every year and refurbished. The train itself, with museum piece back and front engines, is getting marvelously with it and up to date. Because this is what you'd call service. Let's drink in a modern-day manner to yesterday.